Hey Scott, it's great to see you here at the 2006 Sun and Fun Flying. We're sitting in front of the uh, B-29 uh, nose here that's on display that was uh, part of the whole airplane that we have in storage and I think you have an interesting uh, part of the history of this airplane. Tell me a little bit about that. Well in days of yore there was a lot of lore on that old airplane. Back in the 50s and 60s this was the B-29 that launched the D-558 2 Series airplane. And about that was that the X-1 had proven that a good first stage, a poor man's first stage in launching from the air, gave the opportunity a lot more rocket performance. And so it looked like a good thing to do with the, with the D-558 2, which was doing an awful lot of flying on ground takeoff, very performance limited. So they configured two airplanes, actually three of them, two uh, all jet and rocket powered airplanes and one all rocket powered airplane. You'll notice on this up here there are launches from a 144 airplane, which is NACA's number for the all rocket airplane, and 145, which is for the jet and rocket airplane. 143, I think they only flew once after it came mm. from the company. And and this was uh, uh, configured to put the rocket underneath and drop it as a mothership. And how would they actually get the rocket up under the airplane? And well, we had two procedures. One, we had a pit where we put the the mother airplane over the pit, and we had the rocket airplane in there and raised it. And then mm -hmm. the other one was to put the rocket, the B-29, up on jacks way up in the air, bring the rocket airplane. In. Put straps around the belly and hoist it up with the, oh, really? with the chain pole. Put it in the, to uh, uh, bomb. B the bomb bay, yeah. Uh, bomb bays, but, but I mean, uh, bomb locks. Mm -hmm. And same kind of a system in that. And uh, then it was taken to oh, above 30,000 feet, launched at the maximum speed the B-29 would get. It's a beautiful way to get flying. You're in that dark. Bombay, and then all of a sudden you're out in the bright sunlight. But other from that, it's a, you don't have the noise and commotion and the pounding and the full power runs that you do on every takeoff of other. Uh huh. And what kind of speed do you think the B-29 was doing before you kicked in the rockets? I wish I could remember, and I should be able to quote that right off, but not. But my guess was that the indicated airspeed was around 140, which was was below stall with a full weight airplane. As soon as you got the rocket engines going, you could put, it, it accelerated quite rapidly. Really? So there was that much drag with the rocket on the B-29 that it didn't go any faster than that? This was indicated. Okay, indicated. Oh, 30,000 feet, yeah. so you were probably truing out at under 300? Two percent a thousand, whatever. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, yeah, you, you went out, it was relatively slow for the rocket airplane. All of the rocket airplanes uh, launched it probably near or maybe a little below the stall, but you just mm. kept the nose down, got the engines running, then they'd take off and you never worried about that mm. anymore. And were you basically just, the procedure was just to make sure you were clear of the airplane or was there a certain speed you wanted to attain before you hit the button? I always hit those buttons as fast as I could because I figured losing altitude we'd work so hard to get with that V-29, we didn't want to do that. Mm. On the X-1, I just held my fingers under the switches and the negative G's lit the, lit the oh. rockets as I went out of the bomb bay. Huh. On this one, they, they were down on the side and I lit them with a little, little more circumspect. So you actually, you flew the X-1 as well? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Tell me a little bit about that and how did Chuck Yeager end up 
flying it and doing I the flew first. the X-1 long after he flew it. Okay. I didn't join the committee until 1950, and he did Mach 1, I think it was 1947, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I had volunteered to fly it for nothing, or Skip Ziegler, uh, uh, not Skip Ziegler. Uh, Skip uh, Slick Good. Plus, <laughs> Slick Goodland. I get all these guys mixed up. I flew it about 10 times, the X-1. And, uh, and how did that flight with the X-1, uh, those 10 flights with the X-1, help you to fly the Skyrocket? Well, I don't know they helped me, but I flew the X-1 before I flew the Skyrocket. Right. But the Skyrocket was not a difficult airplane to fly in, 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 the, in the center of the envelope. And of course, all the work that we did with the research airplanes were interested in what happened to these different configurations out near the edge of the envelope, whether it be speed, whether it's high or low speed, or whether it be mm -hmm. high yaw or high Gs and all of that. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the X-1 and the, and the, and the D-5582 were not similar, except, you know, in, in the flight plane. With this airplane, of course, swept wings have bad AC transfers and pitch-up characteristics tip stall characters. The air doesn't like high sweep, and yet we, were, we found out this is what we needed for transonic flight. So this airplane really wrote the book for everything that we're flying today. All the airliners and everything else, the basic data came out of this airplane here. Huh. And we were pushed to gather it pretty fast. And for the military, of course, they wanted it yesterday for what was going on. There, so. tell, tell me a little bit about the uh how the Mach 2 flight came about, and uh, was there publicity going on at the time after Chuck's flight, and what was the mentality of the day? Well, the X-1 flew Mach 1, of course, in 1947. 1953 was the 50th anniversary of the Wright brothers, and so the Air Force thought that wouldn't it be neat if they now celebrated with Jaeger flying Mach 2 on, the, on that sort of thing. Sounds like a bit of a race coming on. Uh, it was coming on. <laughs> he had the X-1A, which could easily make Mach 2. They were trying to fly it, and they had a little mechanical difficulty. But they were in no hurry, because there was time before the celebration. And uh, they knew that I was interested in doing that. But they also knew that the state NACA was a research organization was not interested in getting into publicity stunts or records and that. In fact, we made a lot of records, but we never published them. Uh, and, but I thought it'd be kind of neat to stick it to Jaeger and, and beat him to Mach 2, and I didn't even know this airplane, could, the D-5582, could do it. Hmm. Because its maximum design speed was about 1.6. But we had been working up to 1.9, 1.95, 1, but I just never could get much higher than that. Cause the absolute limit, it seemed. Hmm. It was the limit based on you couldn't get it high enough for the true airspeed, or just, you that, didn't have the power? It, it, power, altitude, every, everything. Just the airplane wasn't made to go that fast. Uh, so what we did is we got more power. We put uh, uh, flow diffusers on cones on the, on the rocket engine. We waxed the airplane from one end to the other. We taped every orifice, took every protuberance we could off of the airplane. And even the stuff that uh, we didn't need if it launched, like jettison lines and that, we rigged it so that they stayed with the V-29 rather than went with, with the airplane. Did everything we could to, to do that. And the best we could calculate was that you might, with the grace of God, get 2.05, 2.1. And I was going to have to try it. And, we, we, and all the time, the Air Force now is thinking these guys will never oh, make I'd it. Oh, never make it. And nobody thought that old bird. It had been around a long time and done a lot of work. And, and uh, they, they had no worry about, you know, I was getting <laughs> I had a hunch we might be able to do it. So did other people. And... Uh, we boosted the engines a little bit and played some games with it where I had the tank pressure control put in the cockpit, not for this flight, I'd done that earlier on to get more, so that after we got the engines running, I'd boost the, the tank pressures, the pressurized tanks, and of course that would give us higher pump inlet pressure, higher rocket inlet pressure, 
and so we got uh, more. We could put more fuel into it, and we get more. We boosted the the four rocket engine, the four little rockets, our RMI 11 engine, to uh, from 6,500 pounds to about 8,500 mm. pounds, and that was a substantial increase in, in that fuel flow. Yeah. And then we we loaded the airplane with with liquid oxygen the night before and let it get cold. It just kept filling it until it was the coldest airplane that ever flew. Uh, liquid oxygen, what is it, down minus 290 or some temperature like that. And we had it cold. We, we chilled the uh, alcohol fuel all night long and put it in. We chilled the high. Everything was much more dense and we got a few more gallons of fuel and locks in the airplane. And we had a good cold day and I studied the wind so I could take advantage. It's going to have a slight dive, oh, maybe 10 degrees, maybe not that much. Uh, to go right out, the point I wanted to go to joined out here at Mach 2. Ah. And if I could stay and not deviate one eye on it, it'd have to be a pretty perfect flight. And by luck, I made that perfect flight. Went right out that point at mm. 2.1, they said first, but later on corrected 2.05. Huh. And how, so how actually did they measure the fact that you had, because you've already made the boom and gone Mach 1. I had radar on me, and we had all the flight test instrumentation. All of those airplanes were very, very, had very good instrumentation very on them. Had flight test boom, and we had to go by the flight test boom really because it's airspeed we're looking at. Huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, the direction of flight, I got a little advantage of a changing wind that gave me, uh, it saved a little energy. Everything just came out. I had the flu. <laughs> I, w I shouldn't have been flying, but I was about to give up after all of these oh, guys had worked nights to get this thing going. And Did they do anything to the B-29 to try and maybe get, you know, uh, un unload some stuff so I could get a little higher? I think Butch pushed it probably higher and, and faster and burned a little more fuel and got the engines a little hotter. I don't remember what he launched at. Now, that was, you know, this is, we're talking, what, 60 years ago. What, what, what day and year was this? This is November 20th, 1953. And, uh, and we only had this one shot. Doc Dryden says, all right, we will relieve our, our... So tell me about the announcement and what kind of fallout from the announcement was there? Darn, I can't think of They had a PR guy that just joined NASA at that time, and he took a hold of this thing and ran with it. And they had a big celebration down at... Uh, in San Diego, uh, because fifth, for the 50th anniversary thing, and of course I was invited down. And, uh, oh, so th yeah, I just calculated this happened a month, no, uh, several weeks before the 50th that's right. that's anniversary right. we, of the Wright brothers. Yeah, we were squeezing, we were squeezing the calendar. I sat to es with next to Esther Williams all night long at the banquet at uh -huh. the head table. She got up to make her speech. She says, I've been sitting through what somebody claimed was the fastest man in the world all evening long, and he hasn't made a hit on me yet. <laughs> I'd made a pass at me. I said, well, so I reached over and swatted her gorgeous derriere. The whole place came unglued. But then I was first to make Mach 3 when my wife threw me out of the house. <laughs> she didn't think that was proper. <laughs> But uh, that Mach 2 thing, I don't know, it seems to parlayed into something very important. It really wasn't. When we were going 1-9, yeah. we were doing as good a research as two. But it's a milestone. Milestone. Yeah, it was a milestone, an inch stone, really, in what we've been doing now, going to space. Uh, and Mach 1 is a significant uh, yes. technological uh, barrier, but uh, Mach 2 is just another, another number. Just faster pass. And past so we run. had some fun. And and was there was there any what what kind of reaction did they get from the Air Force? You know after you guys kind of and this was they this were was, a little ticked. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were ticked. they were glad we did it. You know, they, yeah. There was, there was no animosity in here. It, it just that they kind of got caught not paying attention to business. I'll be darned. And, and so how did their celebration go? And did Chuck? Do the he did get the SWAT Esther Williams on the, on the back side, <laughs> but he did go Mach 2 a couple of weeks later. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. he went and, and lost that. Remember that airplane? Oh, is that one a tumble? Yeah, that 
at very high speeds and high altitudes, the damping and the stability of the airplane gets very marginal and you don't dare take a deep breath almost. Bill Bridgman was a remarkable pilot. And he knew how to avoid that so-called supersonic yaw and divergence mm -hmm. with the D5582, and he told me how to do it. I, I owe him. I maybe would have found out myself, but with flying techniques, not let the military pilots. I want, to, I want to say this so I don't put them down in any way, but they're hell. They're, they go for hell for broke. Huh? Yeah. The research pilot knows everything he's going to do in small increments and, mm -hmm. and works his way up in it. So we had an advantage of doing that with the, with the Air Force. To, for instance, the X-2, they sent a non-rocket pilot up to Mach 3.3 on his first flight. Mm. Uh, on, the, on the X-1A, Charlie lost this airplane. If he hadn't been in it, I mean, he lost control or he would never come home and that sort of thing. He's a remarkable, resourceful pilot, but he tumbled about 80,000 feet, mm -hmm. I, eight over T. And he once told me the way, he, you know, a lot of guys will say, oh, the airplane was doing this, they're lying like the devil. When it's going that way, you never recall and know where you are. In fact, that's your biggest problem. You don't know what to correct for because when you do, you're somewhere else in some other attitude. So Charlie just put that airplane into a full spin control and it finally fell into a spin. Uh -huh. And then he knew what, he w what was happening, recovered from the spin, and managed to get it back to, hmm. to Edwards Air Force Base. Hmm. I don't know if I would have thought of that or not. I, maybe I would, but, but I think that was pretty resourceful. Because you don't have time to go to the book and start making no. any plans on things. Tell me a little bit about any of your experience <laughs> with the, the B-29. <laughs> you baiting me? <laughs> I always flew little airplanes. In fact, I think 99% of all the hours I have, I've always been by myself. I never flew a big airplane. But Stan Butchard, who had been my shipmate in the war, and classmate in college, and then he joined us in NACA. And, and, and what, what did you fly in the war? I flew Corsairs and F-6s. I flew F-6s in the war and Corsairs right after the war, before I got out and was in the reserve. And Butch, he liked the big airplanes, and he was my launch pilot most of the time. Uh, I told him, hey, I've never flown a big airplane. Check me out in the B-29. So we got the B-29, went up there, and I flew it. A whole different world of flying from what I'm used to. I'm used to polishing my fingertips from an airplane. This would use all the muscles. Like a, flying a big building. <laughs> Just it's a good description. So I said, you ever stall this thing? Put you sitting in the right seat, and he says, you're flying it. So I sucked it back, and it's beginning to shake a little, a little rumble a little bit. The guys in the back begin yelling, and I pulled it back, it's shaking like mad now, and I looked over and push. I said, how deep a stall do you go into? Because I didn't want to chicken out, and yet I didn't want to mess up things. So he says, you're flying it. So I kept coming and going back. All of a sudden, the right wing went, and it went into a spin. And those four motors started going around. I knew I had my hands full. <laughs> I don't think Butch even touched the control. I think he just sat there and watched me. And I managed to stop it, roll on its back, and then recover, rolled on the way through in a screaming dive. I said, what did you let me do that for? He says, you were flying it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my only experience flying a B-29. Unbelievable. And this airplane, too. And this airplane. 